Hello, I'm Graham Park and welcome to another Creative Future session where we talk to a variety of creative industry professionals in front of an online audience of students from Glendour University. Today's guest is an award-winning photographer who began taking photographs while serving in the Parachute Regiment in Northern Ireland during the late 80s and early 1990s. He left the British Army to study editorial photography at the University of Brighton before becoming a freelance photojournalist. His photographs and articles have been published nationally and internationally in a variety of publications. And in 2009, he released a documentary film based on his powerful photographs of UK military veterans. Please welcome Stuart Griffiths to today's Creative Futures session. Hi, Stuart. Hi, hi. Good to see you, Graham. And hello, Stephen. And hello, everyone here today. Um, yes, and, and it's great to be invited here to give a talk of my photographs online. It's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Broad. Thank you very much for coming and joining us. I'm going to let Stephen King, who's our photography lecturer, uh, lead this session because he's yep. a photography lecturer. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Graham. Cheers. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Stephen. Hi, so everyone, we've got, as uh, Graham just said, we've got photographer, broadcaster, documentarian, and uh, PhD candidate Stuart Griffiths with us today. Uh, and we'll be looking at a bit of a, a chronological journey of your work, I understand. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, I'd say a body of work, you know, rather than, yeah, which we've, a body of work consists of many projects, which is really about my kind of trajectory as a as a photographer, stroke photojournalist, and uh, the ups and downs and uh, of, of, of my existence. But yeah, brilliant. Should, should we uh, go to share the screen? Yeah, that'd be great. And if everyone could uh, mute their mics, please. Oh, okie dokie. So I'm going to go to Google Chrome, do I? Uh, Right, oh, basic. Right, here we go. Um, so it's literally just, uh, sorry, this is a new thing for me, all this, sorry. Has is it, is it come up my... Uh, there you go, go on, you play that. It, come up, yeah. Great. Is it there? Right, well, it's a picture of me here. Uh, when I was a university student back in the uh, mid '90s, um, it's quite interesting which uh, this 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 pose uh, reoccurred in my career, which I will tell you about shortly. Uh, but uh, with my Leica M2 and Rolly Flex, uh, you know that was my thing. I wanted to uh, go and see the world and 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 uh, and, and take photographs of it. But um, we, we all come from um, different pasts and uh, mine was uh, a, a British soldier uh, serving in the 3rd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment. And my first posting was to Northern Ireland. I was sent there at 17. Um, and then when I was 18, I was then posted to a rifle company. And this photograph um, was taken on my camera, which was given to me, well, as it was a present from my stepfather on my 18th birthday, which um, I'd never had a camera before ever. I, I, mean, I must admit, I, was, I wasn't, I was interested in photographs. I was interested in magazines, but I didn't own a camera. I was probably more interested in cartoon illustration and things like that. I, I saw photography, if you like, something which um, dads would do. And uh, so anyway, my dad bought me my first camera for my 18th birthday, which was an Olympus trip. And, and I had a black and white roll of film. And, and this is a photograph mm -hmm. from that, which is obviously taken by another soldier. And I'm in the back of a an army mm -hmm. personnel character. Uh, character. Well, Stuart, so that yeah. was the first time. So your first engagement with photography was after you'd actually joined up? Yeah, right? well, I, jo I joined at 16. Yeah. Um, so how, how was it? Was it um, accepted that you could, at that time, you could take pictures of, your life in the army was that okay? Um, as you can see from this picture and and the first roll of uh, film I had, um, you know, there wasn't many pictures to begin with. It started as a very slow process. Um, I 
if you like, because I had an Instamic camera, um, the times when it would usually be taken out would be on QRF patrol, for example, which was quick reaction force, where we would be in the back of a Land Rover, two two guys, you know, two soldiers stood in the back with the weapons, and, and we'd, we'd satellite the areas. And the reason why we would take pictures of QRF because we were out of the, you know, prying eyes of our senior uh, NCOs, uh, non-commissioned officers, sergeants and officers and all that. Um, but again, because it was a instamatic camera, it wasn't really taken that much seriously. It was it was just something um, which many soldiers did anyway. They, they had this thing. In fact, uh, uh, academic John Hockey wrote a book called Squaddies and he mentions in there about how he, he went on his field study trips to Cross McGlen and uh, out came the camera for, you know, soldiers taking their warry photo. That's what the what he coined it as. And very much we were doing the same, although we didn't call it a warry photo. We were just, you know, it was and, and because I was a bit known as the, uh, you know, I used to do cartoon drawings and stuff like that. And I was a bit more artistically kind of aware than many others in the platoon. They, they just took a blind eye to it, to be honest. And uh, But like I say, it started relatively slowly. And go, go. I'm just trying to get the next frame here. Uh, there we go. So, and then obviously the, the shift to colour film here. Um, and the reason for that was because you couldn't get black and white film in the NAFI, which is like the, you kind of on camp you know, news agents where you got your toiletries or your, you know, your, your cheese and tomato pizzas film. And um, so I started to photograph what was around me, if you like. I mean, this, this is the, this was a, what we took out on patrol every, every, every day when we were working on, um, you know, hard patrolling of, of, of one of the SF bases. This was, this is what all the bullets we had. And, um, this was someone's letter that was, uh, he was getting letters from Brighton and uh, the actual photograph in that letter is, is just a photograph from, it's like an outtake from a, from a fashion shoot. And this guy worked at the processing lab, he used to write to his, to his friend and put these uh, pictures in and make these fictitious na na narrations about, you know, I miss you, this, that. And of course we would read them and go, bloody hell, we've got to go to Brighton. This is, sounds fantastic. But it, it was all, it was all a facade. It wasn't real, uh, but the bullets and the gun was, if you, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, yeah, and so anyway, I kind of carried the camera with me in my webbing pouch throughout, and um, and the more you know that the, the the residential tour progressed, the more I felt confident in taking pictures. And this person in particular, uh, who was the guy from lived in, in Brighton, used to receive these letters. He kind of encouraged me to say, oh, you know, you've got a camera, you should use it more, blah, 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 you know. But, the, but his encouragement was really that he wanted to be photographed all the time. Um, so he could have his warry photo. And um, it, it's quite interesting, this picture, which is which has been used um, in my first book, The Myth of the Airborne Warrior, it also was used as um, uh, to... Uh, in a review by Sean O'Hagan on the, the art of, of, of war photography, where he wrote about my book and Janina Strzok's um, private pictures, which is about photography uh, throughout the world uh, or personal military photography. And, and, the, and this image was used, you know, and it's called Barrel of Laughs. And uh, during that time when I took these photographs, I used to have... Um, I would, uh, I'd, I'd make duplicate copies and the person in the photograph, he had, he always had a duplicate copy because he just loved being photographed. And, um, so when I started researching and, and gathering all my material from, from my archive and then realizing what I had and what I hadn't, I, I went to him and said, uh, you know, that all the photographs I took, uh, you've got copies of, can I, can I, can I see them, you know? And, uh, and then, lo well, well and behold, this picture came out. And I went, I remember that. Because it was literally one of these ER grift, take a picture of this. And it was click, boom, forgot about it. And uh, when I tried to find the negative, um, the negative was, was, wasn't, wasn't there. And, um, and I must admit, when, when this, um, 
you know, again, going back, reliving that, that narrative of, of getting the films processed back in 1990, I would go to the Naffy or, or this guy would. And obviously this guy went and when he saw that was in there, he was thought, I'm getting rid of that. That's copy for me. And <laughs> so it's, it's interesting how, you know, over the years, the truth sort of comes out. And, uh, but yeah, it was also used in the masculinities uh, uh, publication, not the exhibition, um, but the, the publication and, um, and, and, and many other things. And, you know, it's 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 quite an unnerving image, uh, which for me really um, expressed how a lot of us felt. You know, it was like you know, the, you know, the, I would say in Northern Ireland it was ninety percent bored and then ten percent mayhem. You know, and you know when it did kick off, it really did kick off. And and obviously being in the parachute regiment, it it was you was always right in the thick of it all. Um, because as I later learned um, um, from being in Northern Ireland, they, the you know, nationalist community absolutely hated the parachute regiment. And, and that go, goes back to the 30th of January 1972 with Bloody Sunday. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, it, it was, um, you know, a, a very interesting time, but very, very uh, fraught time as well. Um, especially for, for, for an 18 year old, but then, you know, I, I did join up. Oh. So did you find that a lot of your, th these images with people were, the, were like that, you didn't really set much up, it was just... No, it was just, hey, it was just, this, just point and shoot, you know, um, I mean, there were many other pictures, you know, with, you know, against murals and things like that, and street scenes, and, uh, and I guess I, I was into this documentation of, of what we were doing, uh, because the press certainly weren't doing anything. Um, and we were, we were taught, I and mean, we had this kind of mistrust of the press anyway. And, uh, and it was like that the, the press were always sympathetic to the IRA cause. This, this is what was, you know, talked about during my time as a, as a young British soldier. And we certainly didn't have like, you know, you know, Don McCullen coming over and doing whatever it was, uh, so it was very much a kind of we do it for ourselves. It was if one, especially at the, the parachute regiment in general, didn't really want journalists or photographers sniffing around. Uh, but also it, it felt like no one really cared what we were doing anyway, because sort of in the late 80s and early 90s, the only time that, uh, you know, if, if a British soldier was killed in Northern Ireland, you know, if there was, a you know, say free soldiers like, you know, during the tour, the Mayo Bridge bombing, there was there was three guys who, who were killed. That'd make the news, um, but it, very little was kind of done really, and and more emphasis was put on when the IRA bombed mainline UK, you know, Britain, you know, or London or something like that. Um, so it was like, for me as a young soldier, then it felt like no one really cared. So I felt I should document this. Uh, you know, this journey myself. Um, and, and also there was always this idea that I could use these photographs as a, as a template for, you know, should I one day, you know, go to art college and become a painter or an illustrator or something. It was, it was like kind of, you know, I'm, I'm going to get something from this, whether people like it or not. And uh, like I say, they, they turn a blind eye to it. And, uh, and, and most of the time they just thought I was, you know, just a wacky artist <laughs> and I'd go into the wacky artist thing. This, this picture in particular was uh, taken at Christmas, 1990. We were on Christmas rear party guard duty. So we had to look after the camp while um, everyone went home on leave. And uh, this was after the Christmas party. And if anyone, you know, could get to their own book next disco, it would, uh, probably explain it a bit more but uh you know this was during our downtime and uh and one of the guys had decided to get a can of green spray paint and spray Y on my clockwork orange poster but again the clockwork orange poster reinforces uh you know the kind of attitude or state of mind i had and when you walk into someone who's got pictures like this it was i don't know it, it, 
as we know in, in many kind of masculine environments that you know if you are the weak link the tendency of, of bullying is becomes very apparent so you have all these little things to kind of guard you if you like you know and uh, i remember once um, in my bed space in hq company when i joined free parrot at age 17 and uh, I had my clockwork orange pictures in my bed space. And I remember coming uh, back from a, from a bar shift because I was, I was put in the bar because I was too young to patrol the streets uh, at 17. And I came back and there was two guy, two naked guys in, in, on my bed lying and one with a huge moustache. And it was, again, just trying to sort of provoke this kind of, you know, homoerotic kind of uh, thing. And uh, but whatever, you know, it's... You know, and there was other instance where, you know, you were made to do loads of press ups in the, uh, in the in the washroom. I mean, it was just like, yeah. And, you know, it was because we've all gone through a certain process in training. It, it, it didn't really kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was, you know, bullied um, uh, at all. Um, and, and with Clockwork Orange posters in your bed space, they just thought you were a nutcase. So they were kind of part of your security really in a weird way um and then after the residential tour of uh, northern ireland we came back to the uk january 91 we're on standby for the gulf on 24 hours notice to move only to be told that we weren't being sent because of uh, we were mechanized basically we didn't have didn't drive around in these armoured personnel vehicles and stuff. So the Staffordshire Regiment was sent instead. And uh, a lot of guys signed off, you know, because, you know, whether, you, you know, whatever personal thoughts are on, on war and conflict, if you if you join the Parachute Regiment, um, that's kind of the, the kind of, and, you know, that's, that's, that's what you join up for, really, to, to go and do that. Whether it's naive thinking or not, that's that was the kind of, you know, every soldier, especially in, 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 and the parachute regiment wants their own baptism of fire and uh so when we uh missed out on that it was it was quite you know quite annoying but looking on you know in hindsight with what happened with the gulf and uh you know although there is no admitting you know the government won't admit it the gulf war syndrome it wasn't it wasn't a, i don't think any war is great but going back to that thing of baptism of fire um I was trained as a soldier by Falklands war veterans. So, you know, they were, it was, it, you know, this whole charging mountains with bayonets fixed on your, on, on your weapons and, you know, marching many miles, you know, with huge packs and, and that their spirit decor, you know, it was, was highly intense and um, it was, um, yeah. So we didn't go, we didn't go the Gulf, but what we did do, um, I, 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 well, what I did, I then, um, I knew the battalion photographer and he, he was getting out probably because he was, you know, the Gulf War never happened, maybe. And um, he said his job was, was going to be uh, available as a unit photographer. And if, if you was interested, uh, you know, I'll put your name in the hat. And uh, I used to learn about photography with him because I was interested. You know, I'd go in the dark room, process black and white films and... Uh, and you know, kind of learn all that stuff. And I, and for me, especially back in Aldershot, it was great because it kept me out of going to the, you know, to Aldershot down to the pubs and just spending all my army wages. You know, it was it was, and it was creative. So um, when he when when he was sort of, uh, yeah, I, I, my name was in it was in was in the hat. And, and then I was asked if if I want to. Well, I was asked. I was just said that you going on a photographic course. And uh, the photographic course was, was at um, RAF Cosford in Wolver Wolverhampton. Mm -hmm. And it was called the Northern Ireland Photographic Assistant Course, or NIPA for short. And uh, we learned about, you know, processing um, black and white colour. Massive. I mean, the lenses we using, I mean, I've, I've, not, I've tried looking on eBay for some of them. There was this 3,000 mil bucket lens, which was like a literally like a white bucket. And I've, I've never seen another one to this day. But so it was all about surveillance work, also about working with cameras covertly. So 
shooting from the hip, you know, all the kind of Robert Frank stuff, if you like, yeah. you know, it was, we're learning all that, you know, you know, without having to raise your camera to the eye, you know, just distance it, you know, and, and, and looking at what F stops so you could get whatever in focus. So at the time I thought, why do we need to learn this? But, you know, years later you think, well, that was actually very valuable. Yeah. It's a pretty in-depth, um, quick yeah. training, yeah. That, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So that was four weeks. And then after the four weeks, I was, um, yeah, went to, went to the in, Intel as a unit photographer, and uh, my first posting uh, in the Intel was Kenya, and I went there for three months. And I've got some snapshots uh, which I, I managed to you know keep, but most of my work just went to the to the Intel, and it was just gone. I'd never see anything again, like the light firing exercises with the one bats, the uh, the parachuting into um, in, into Kenya with, with all the you know loads of soldiers just creaming in and <laughs> having to have the letter M written on the head with, because they've been shot up with morphine. And um, yeah, it, it, it was an amazing place. And I must, and I, I, I sort of say to my own children, I said, well, when I, when I joined up um, and I managed to, you know, because my stepfather couldn't even adopt, adopt me. Uh, it was all a bit messy. So I changed my name um, when I was, um, at, uh, when I joined up and um, and then I was given a passport and the first place I ever went abroad to was Belfast so going from Belfast and then to, to Kenya was it was phenomenal it was absolutely amazing you know it was it was I, I really really um, it was a real eye-opener and and I I just thoroughly enjoyed every, every minute of it it was it was fantastic and uh, I was going around from all over Kenya, just, you know, photographing, you know, A company on exercise here or C company there. And, and, and even on the final exercise, I was with the anti-tank platoon. So I just drove around in a big four ton vehicle with all the, all the uh, wombats, which these, these sort of huge weapons to fire, you know, wombat shells. And, and when we returned to the UK, it would have been early March, 92. And we were all thinking we were going to go to Belize for about nine, nine months. But uh, in true kind of military power edge fashion, we were saying, well, don't hold your breath. And sure enough, we weren't going to Belize for nine months. We were going to Northern Ireland again for uh, an emergency tour of Tyrone. And uh, there's mixed opinions and mixed views. And then I've got an article from the Mirror uh, around that time saying that we were sent there to bolster, you know, the, the general election vote and, whatever uh, but the main th thing was that in Tyrone there was massive uh, provisional IRA uh, um, things going on uh, and we were sent there to kind of you know give a presence and uh, and do what we had to do and uh, I was kind of in, in based in Cookstown SF base and um, I'd go out on, on various you know, things in, in civilian clothes and, and, and civilian cars with long lenses and do all, all the surveillance stuff. And uh, and then one of the jobs was was photographing a page three girl visit. Uh, they visited uh, Dungan. And, and the reason why they visited the, uh, I mean, the pictures looks quite humorous, but uh, the reason why they came over was one of our lads got his legs, well, he stepped on a landmine and lost both his legs. And um, that, again, because he survived, it, it sort of had greater impact. Um, and the fact that, you know, he lost both his legs, it was like, you know, it, it was quite a lot. And, 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 and the, also the thing that was personal to me, that was my old platoon as well. And so one of my best friends was actually in that section that got hit. And, you know, it, it, he taught, you know, he was, right there you know seeing the seeing him screaming and everything and uh i don't I, I just kind of thought well is this really what you know life's about you know um this it kind of brought the reality home and uh i started to have um different thoughts about whether i was gonna persevere with a full-blown army career or and again i was getting more and more into the photography and um and again, you know, I was I was sort of thinking, what do I want to be? Do you know? Do I want to be a soldier or do I want to be a paratrooper? And uh, 
or do I want to be a photographer? And um, let's just get to the next slide. And this is one of the pictures I sort of took from Tyrone, which looks like a double exposure. Um, I've recently got a scanner, so I've been going scanning them. So anyway, th th this photograph uh, came about from, I started to kind of create a project uh, in, in a, in a, while I was on the Tyrone tour. Um, and it was like a, a day in the life, you know, I mean, I hadn't known about Life magazine, so it was probably from my youth uh, when I was a child or something. But, you know, this, this day in the life thing was, it's a bit like the Kodak moment, the day in the life, you know. Um, and I, I was more interested in photographing the soldiers rather than, you know, just wait to see if, you know, if I could photograph an IRA player with a long lens, you know, uh, which was obviously more one of my main jobs. And I just started taking lots and lots of photos of, of, of troops on the ground and interacting with locals and all that. And, uh, and it was one of these, uh, it was from taking these pictures and then, and then there was a moment where, and it was again, because of the lad who lost his legs. And then there was all right that happened in in in, uh, in and around coal island and and a lot and even a brigadier was uh, was dismissed which never happened in the whole history of uh, of, the, of the northern island troubles and um and i took these photographs of all these paratroopers bomb bursting out this fs base uh, security forces uh, all cammed up and uh, i mean it, it sounds you know there i was sat behind these sandbags taking these photos of course to get back into the uh into into the base i had to go for the guard room and of course when i went for the guard room they said right griffiths where's the film hand over the film and it was it was well you know I, i'll process it myself this that no you won't it's going to lisbon you know blah. obviously they saw it as quite highly sensitive and i never saw them photos again so um and because of the, the the rioting and the brigadier being sacked and all these things, we were kind of ordered to leave the province basically because it, the public opinion was just too great. Also, to cap it off, there was these it was a war crimes tribunal to Falklands war veterans, and and it wasn't a good place to be. It was, and I just thought, and then they sort of said, right, oh Griffiths. Um, do you want to sign on or are you going to sign off? And, and I just said, well, I'm going to sign off. So uh, as soon as I decided I was signing off, I was then told to leave my uh, photographer's uh, job and uh, I was posted back into the bar, as a, in the, but this time the officer's mess. Um, and it, but I started my camera. I, I, had a, I think I had a 401X Nikon, which I thought was top of the state of the art top of the range at the time you know with a pop-up flash on it you know yeah. and, uh, and uh and what was happening in 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 uh everywhere really you know because we looked at the mainstream press and all that and obviously that trickles through into the kind of subconscious but what we had in older shot was um next to one of the most prominent airborne boozers called the fives wine bar was a, a nightclub called the um I think it was called the limelight and at the limelight wasn't the normal kind of disco tech if you know what i mean it was it had djs like uh, lsd and groove rider and uh, mm -hmm. i used to get all these people from all from around the kind of m25 descend onto this place with their aluminous gloves and whistles and stuff and uh, of course we embraced it because you know the crime was you know, getting caught. So we would go to all these, uh, you know, places, you know, and all this kind of love and, you know, greatness and, you know, and then go back to, you know, Brunavel Barracks, chewing, chewing gum for hours on end, wondering, you know, what, what was going on. And this picture in particular was, was uh, at an after party, uh, just, you know, basically smoking dope to the early hours of the morning, listening to, uh, you know, rave tapes, uh, and just you know just talking and babbling loads of nonsense and uh that really was a kind of a pivotal moment because it kind of escalated to the point of where more and more off-duty soldiers would, would would get involved in the rave scene and, uh, and it was only a matter of time when the uh the wheels would come off the stagecoach uh, so to speak and uh after i left 
um, and I had my I had my final party in Brighton rather than Aldershot, and uh, there was like a small entourage of, of paratroopers that came, and they got caught on the motorway uh, that Sunday, and then reported back to the guard room, and then Colchester for uh, I don't know how long they were given Colchester for, but that's Colchester's a military prison, and then they were booted out, uh, you know, and the and they had this. I, they certainly wouldn't have had exemplary after their record. They were just services no longer required, which, you know, it's like, well, you know, thanks for all your service and, you know, see you later. But luckily for me, I, you know, I, would, I'd, I was living in Brighton and, um, and, but, oh, well, this, this picture here, this, this was uh, just before I, I left 92. Is this one of your last pictures? Yeah. This is this is, would have been my last picture. This was on a final exercise in in Otterburn, um, one of the many military training areas, and uh, it it was on that exercise that I read Don McCullen's Unreasonable Behaviour, and that really, mm. you know, I thought, you know, I've, I've, that's uh, I've made the right move. I'm going to come out. I'm going to become a war photographer. You know, simple as that. So you were, your aim was to keep that thread, but in a civilian mode. Yeah, yeah. It was basically. It was wanting to be free, but still do the same thing, if you know what I mean. I mean, again, it's a, it, it's, it's a naive thing because I had no idea about there was like millions of other photographers outside. That, it didn't mean that, that it didn't matter to me because I was ex free para and that was it. You know, I had a maroon stain on the brain. I mean, I remember when I actually decided to leave and uh, they said, well, we'd like you to go to the uh, the Royal Ordnance Corps and join the photographic unit because you got you got a distinction on your photographic uh, Northern Ireland photographic assistant course and um, but I was having none of that I didn't I didn't want to wear um, you know I didn't want to be as, as they say in the parachute I didn't want to be a crapper I wanted to you know I was I was a paratrooper or nothing you know that's how intense the doctrine was uh, of, of you know them kind of uh, units and uh, but at the same time I didn't like the fact that uh, my films were being taken away and I wanted to keep you know my art if you like and I always saw photography as, 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 as my art because you know I, I was quite artistically motivated as a, as a, as a, as a, as a kid and uh, so he was trying to have the best of both worlds if you like but as we know you know you can't have everything and um, so yeah this 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 exercise was the was the final exercise and uh, I read Don's book and, uh, you know, despite the fact that uh, he was sacked from the Sunday Times magazine and all that, it didn't really matter the fact that, you know, I want to, I want to do, I want to go to war. I want to, I want to, you know, you know, I don't want to shoot a rifle. I want to shoot my camera. You know, I, I wanna, I, a lot of it was this sense of adventure. Uh, you still wanted that intensity that that lifestyle had sort of brought, but you wanted. The yeah, 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 time. exactly. Yeah. And, and Northern Ireland changed me a great deal because that experience in itself was immense, you know. I mean, dealing with the hatred, I mean, you could you could scrape it off the walls. It was it was massively intense. I mean, you know, I mean, even when I, I got out and there was a bomb in Manchester, and then there was a bomb, the Warrington bombing, and I actually thought the provisional IRA were after me, you know. It like, was, you, so everyone doesn't know that you're originally from Warrington. Yeah, 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 from Warrington. Well, I, I but South, I was born in Woodinshire Hospital and then brought up in Warrington, yeah. So I, 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 you know, yeah, I mean, I was paranoid as hell, you know. <laughs> Bizarre, you know, and uh, yeah. So that, that Otterburn, yeah. And so I moved to Brighton because, again, you know, there was people who was in my platoon who lived in Brighton and a few of them had moved down there and they said yeah it's brilliant you know it was it was quite hedonistic it was there were a lot of parties going on and um, and it just seemed a better place to go than Aldershot or Warrington basically and um, you know there's a lot more going on and uh, I'd already been to Brighton a few times when I'd been on leave because obviously when I was in Aldershot going to Brighton didn't take as long as going to Warrington, you know, on the train. And uh, so I kind of built a few contacts there and moved there. But the thing I must admit, when I moved to Brighton was, I, I, I remember, remember thinking then, I've got no subject matter. You know, 
what's my, you know, what do I photograph? Because I've been so used to photographing, you know, military things, soldiers and, and, and all that. And, uh, and I, yeah, you know, what, what, what do I take pictures of? And, uh, th this is one of the few pictures that I took. I, this was taken on transparency film. And this is, you know, some kind of weed dealer's uh, kitchen, you know, and uh, he was a hot carrier and, uh, yeah, I just do these like observations and, uh, and then what kind of happened, um, it would be 93, 94. Luckily I had a job and I was working because the lads I was living with who were, uh, oh, who I served with, they decided that they were going to go to go into to one of the lads, moms who lived in Nottingham. So they got on the train and they were absolutely out of their head on alcohol. And what they did, they kicked off on a train and uh, basically by the time they got from Brighton to Victoria, the the, uh, the transport police were waiting and um, they were basically, to cut a long story short, they're all in prison, prison for about 18 months apiece. And I was very lucky that I wasn't there uh, but also, I, if I was there, I don't think it would have happened anyway. But anyway, besides the point of that, it was... Um, so my kind of mates, if you like, were all serving time in Wandsworth. And I was like, well, you know, where, where do I go? And uh, so I, I got I got to know this kind of little artistic, um, this art community, if you like, who had a workshop um, just by St. Bartholomew's Church in Brighton. And they used to have these, they organised these illegal parties, the Free Bob Party, as I've... I've I've, I've now found out, um, but they said, oh, we want you to be our unofficial photographer of the Church of the Subgenius, uh, you know, would you be up for that? And uh, you, they knew things weren't great and uh, I, was, I was struggling. And uh, so this photograph again, which is, it's had quite, quite a lot of usage. Um, it's in the um, Seaside Photographed exhibition, which I think it's going to go big to Blackpool. Um, well, we don't know with all this COVID thing, but uh, it, it started off at the turn of contemporary in, in, in Margate. And um, I think I've got, there's a book of it somewhere. Yeah. Well, the, oh. <laughs> Did you get them, them ones without the, <laughs> the card? Yes, one day. But anyway, this book here, Seaside Photographed, by Val Williams and Karen Shepherdson. Um, it's in that, and uh, but yeah, it was it was just to kind of good to kind of get involved and in, in, in something that wasn't just military all the time, to be honest. And uh, this photograph in particular, which I took about six o'clock in the morning on a, a Sunday morning, um, was um, I remember someone coming up to me and saying, "I mean, the, the actual exhibition there's a triptych." You see like three images yeah. and uh, it, it, you can actually see it in, in one of the other photos. Um, uh, there's a, there was a, someone who said, oh, are you a copper? You know, what are you taking pictures for? You know, and you're, and you're not going to turn around and go, oh, well, you know, in years to come, this is going to be history. You, know? <laughs> you just, whatever, you know. And so, and, and again, probably it's, it's an interesting picture because no one had a camera. I did, you know, it was, it was a Nikon FM2 with a 28 mil lens and yeah. So I was this didn't... kind of your first kind of foray into using photography as a more artistic thing rather than documenting your army well, life, obviously well, before? I think it was a sense of, I, in terms of artistic, I think it was more about documentation all the time. And, and again, you know, I had this idea at the beginning of, of my photography journey, if you like, in the army, that photography was art. But when I started reading about what photography inspired me, uh, it wasn't so much art anymore. It was more about, you know, documentary photography, if you like, because um, photojournalism, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting. I'd, I'd say I've done photojournalism, but you, you're responding to a story and a narrative uh, and, and you've got, and it has to fulfill a brief and all these sort of things have to, you know, you have to put into the equation of stuff. But um, 
I think this image really was, you know, documenting a, a kind of time and place which wouldn't happen again, basically. Because mm. when I returned, because again, I thought, you know, I could make this into a project, you know, this could be quite interesting. I mean, it was literally one roll of film that I've, and I've, I went back to other ones, but it just was never the same. It didn't have the same kind of gathering. It seemed more kind of, you know, grimmer grittier there was sort of people really out of the nuts you know it was uh you know i remember seeing someone kind of like you know you know look like he's having an epileptic fit slavering from his mouth because he'd taken too much ghb or something and uh, it just seemed unpleasant you know what i mean it was that was kind of part of an era i mean if you can actually look there's, there's this like lone guy stood at the brow of the thing and you know obviously looking over and uh I mean, there was, a, I don't know if it was that weekend, but I know there was a suicide there. And uh, I know there was gangs coming in from London who were selling, you know, kind of harder kind of drugs and stuff. And, uh, you know, so I, I saw that as really as, as, as a moment in time when things were, you know, it, it was great, but it was like, it's a bit like kind of when, when you know, you, you do a big job as a freelance photographer, you go, brilliant, and it gets published, and then you go, fantastic, what's next, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, for me, kind of resonates that, you know, it, it was a moment in time where it was then, great it was, then. Yeah, yeah, there was a great then. It, that was the moment, and, and it never was kind of replicated again. I mean, they've, they've tried to have parties there, even in 1999, I believe, and other things, but it, nothing was like that time, do you know what I mean? So it was good to be, you know, there to, to do that. And and again, that's the power of photography, isn't it? Because if I hadn't have been there to take that photograph, you know, well, I don't know, you know, maybe someone might have taken other pictures. I've never seen them, do you know what I'm saying? Mm. Okay. And so anyway, I went after that, uh, that was 94, criminal justice bill came in to make them kind of parties that I'd just shown you illegal. Um, I got onto university um, uh, and the reason why I got onto university was, I mean, I applied to go to university after I got out the, uh, out the, uh, out the parachute regiment and had my interview. And I remember one of the lecturers saying, you know, so what do you, what do you want to be as a photographer? And I remember saying, I want to be a war photographer. And I never got into to, to Brighton that year. Uh, but I wasn't in a great place anyway, because my stepfather had died of throat cancer. And I was a bit all over the place. And uh, But anyway, I, I went to Northbrook College in Worthing and did a part-time diploma whilst I was on, on an unemployment benefit. And... Uh, and that kind of helped me uh, get on to, to, to do the editorial photography course at Brighton because, you know, I knew more about, you know, Paul Rees, Martin Parr and, uh, you know, more the kind of language of photography, if you like. And I certainly didn't mention uh, I wanted to be a war photographer. Uh, I kind of kept that really stum and, uh, I, and I didn't even show any of my military pictures either. You know, I, I um, wanted to really put that up, you know, put that behind me and try and move on. And um, this picture in particular, Albania 1996, and people have said, you know, why was you in Albania in 1996? A, a friend of mine was working for a magazine called War Report in, um, what did it be, sort of the Angel Lislington. And he said, um, you want to keep your eye out on Kosovo because that's where tensions are happening. Because, I mean, we had the, the, you know, the Gulf, obviously, in, in 91. And then after the Gulf was Bosnia. Again, we were never sent to any of these things as, 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 as a member of the Parachute Regiment. And um, so the Kosovo thing was bubbling. And uh, and I, I'd gone to some lecture at the School of Slavonic Studies in London. And uh, I bought this book called The Blue Guide to Albania. And I, I kind of like this idea of visiting this this. Uh, this, you know, communist dystopian kind of landscape of, uh, of you know, I mean, Albania was very aligned to the, uh, the uh, communist China rather than communist Russia. Mm -hmm. It had been closed off for a long, long time during the Enver Hoxha period. They had all these like kind of look like portobello mushrooms everywhere, which were air raid shelters for everyone. And uh, I mean, it just looked 
just a, looked a very interesting place. So I decided to go to Albania for Christmas of 96 and <laughs> because I'd got my student grant and uh, I had my Roliflex and uh, I'd just broken up with this uh, from, from a relationship with um, this um, crazy Glaswegian um, dental nurse, uh, which was probably a good thing. And um, so I went to Albania. Yeah, yeah. So just, just on a whim, just on a bit of information, a lecture, a book. And you yeah. just funded it and just, you had no yeah. contacts? No... I had no contacts whatsoever. I, I just thought I'd go there, I'd pay my flight, and I had a bit of spending money. In fact, I remember getting a, an extension on my overdraft the, the day I was No flying. mobile phone? No mobile phone, nothing. And uh, I got on the flight from, I probably would have, might have been Gatwick, yeah. And uh, immediately I got talking to someone who went to Lancaster University. And he says, yes, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. You go and say, this is my home country. You know, I see you reading that book, blah, blah, blah. You know, you, you come stay with my, I've got, I've got, you know, family out there. No, and of course, I became friends with him straight away, you know, and uh, <laughs> but he now works at the UN, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we don't keep in touch regularly, but we're, he's always there and I can always get in touch with him. And, uh, but it was amazing. And I just thought, well, this is meant to be, this is meant to be. And uh, so I hung out in Tirana for a bit and, and then I thought, well, I'm just sitting in coffee bars, um, you know, drinking brandies and coffees all the time with my friend. Uh, I really want to see the place. And uh, this picture in particular was taken up in Skodra, which is the northwest of Albania. And it's an amazingly fascinating place. I think I've got some pictures that I added to it. Yeah, here we go. Um, these are all, all the best pictures came from Skodra. And this one on the right, uh, that's Isa Bolentini, who was a Kosovo hero. So... You know, I mean, when you think about Kosovo and you could see the tensions of it, apparently Serb, well, Serbia was born in or Kosovo. Yeah, Serbia was born in Kosovo. That's why the Serbians were really, you know, very sort of, you know, wanted to kind of keep it. And then you obviously got a lot of Albanians there. And this guy, Isa Bolantini, was, was the Kosovo hero. So these things, are, you know, there's a lot of history to them. And um, I kind of went there and... Shortly after I returned, Albania was on the news because I remember going around with my, my friend from Lancaster University and I remember seeing this beam of light shooting all around Tirana. I said, well, what's this? He said, oh, that's the, and it was like a pyramid on the sky. He said, that's the Pyramid Foundation. Everyone's investing their money into this pyramid thing. And it's really great. You know, we're all this, we're all investing, you know. Anyway, this Pyramid Foundation collapsed and the whole country just spun into total anarchy. And I was a little bit sort of, Oh God, if I'd stayed there just a you know, week or so longer, I would have had a, a really big news story, you know. And uh, But anyway, I entered the images into the, um, the 1997 Observer Hodge Award and was highly commended. So that kind of got my foot in the door with the Observer newspaper. Uh, so, but yeah, it was, yeah, it was great. And obviously, most of the pictures I did, and obviously these ones I'm showing here, are all on the square format. So it was the Rolleiflex, which mm. they're fantastic cameras to use in these sort of situations because people just think you're an antique, and it's great, you know. Yeah, and they, you're kind of you looking know. down. You're looking, you know, low down, yeah. you're looking at someone, so they don't that, know. That's it. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it, it, people just sort of think, you know, you're a curiosity more than anything. Um, rather than, you know, this serious Nikon, you know, with whatever lens, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I, it, it was it was great. Uh, I, I, I loved every minute of that. Um, and then I went to, um, moved to London and I was an intern at Magnum, or well, Network Photographers first, which was like a, an independent photo agency for photographers. And then from that, I was an intern at, at Magnum. Um, How did you land that one? It's pretty much, you know, it's like the well, most. It was, sort of... well, it, well, it was, it was, it was literally someone at network knew someone, and said, "You contact this person." The person I contacted was Ham a guy called Hamish Crooks, whose his dad was Abaz, and I showed him my portfolio and uh, you know my Albania pics and stuff like that, and uh, he said, "Well, you know." We can offer you know you, yeah you come in as an intern you know this 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 time if you if you're available and uh, so I was doing that for about about six weeks or something you know I'd, I'd you know I'd met people like you know Donovan Wiley and uh, who else Elliot Erwitt, uh 
Ian Berry, uh, Eve Arnold, you know, wow. quite a, you know, some pretty famous That's Some people. pretty famous names there, yeah, at the most prestigious yeah. photo agency yeah. of all time, wow. Yeah, and I kind of used, no, I wouldn't say used, but I kind of, because I was there, I, I, I remember contacting the uh, International Red Cross, because um, what happened, in fact, how the narrative actually is, really, uh, with all this, someone called up the Magnum office wanting to do a documentary on an up-and-coming uh, conflict photographer or war photographer. And everyone was like, oh, no, I'm not a war photographer, man. You know, it's like, you know, just to even be called that was just seen as crass back in the, you know, the mid-90s. Do you know what I mean? It's like, war photographer, you know, which you think I am? Uh, so I agreed to see this person and... Uh, we sort of talked about ideas. I said I was interested in, in trying to get to Kosovo, this blah, blah. I, mean, I think I remember seeing some some offices at, uh, down the King's Road. Uh, it might have been, was it Four Para, um, the TA battalion? Um, and then there was no joy with that. And then I remember seeing this this documentary about Congo Brazzaville on World, would have been, I don't know if World in Action was on then, but it would have been one of them news programmes. I remember seeing these 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 guys and they had lampshades on the red and aviator shades and uh, Kalashnikovs and I just thought this looks really mad you know this looked fantastic you know to go and have a look anyway so I I got in touch with the International Red Cross and they said well we've got a, a, a humanitarian aid program or or something going on in, in Congo Brazzaville and you're welcome to come over providing that you just pay for your own flight and I said well that's good enough for me you know blah 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 you know you know the fact that I was you know you know, when they would call back, they would go, they'd call the Magnum office because obviously I didn't have a telephone or anything. And that, that looked good. So what I decided to do was 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 work for the International Red Cross in Congo, Brazzaville, but I needed to get to Kinshasa firstly in the Democratic Republic of Congo to, to meet the team. Now, so you had to get two separate visas. You had to get a visa for the Republic of Congo and then one for the Democratic Republic of Congo. But I managed to get it just all squared away. And when I paid for the flight, uh, this documentary filmmaker sort of contacted me and uh, he said, oh, well, we're not, we're not doing the film now. Um, it, it's, it's too dangerous. And I was thinking, <laughs> OK, well, you know, uh, so what? You know, I'm going anyway. Do you know what I mean? Because I didn't really care. If, uh, you know, I mean, my life wasn't dependent on someone's film being made. You know what I mean? It's, it, it was about my career, you know, and um, so I uh, got on the flight and I was hoping to, to, to experience the same thing I did in Albania. But that didn't happen, no, at all. The nearer I got, the more and more freaked out. I remember stopping off at Lisbon in Portugal thinking, I think I should get off this flight and just go to Portugal because I had a friend there who's got land. And, um, and the more and more I was, got nearer and nearer to Kinshasa, the more uneasy I felt about it. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was also on as well was Larium, which was an anti-malaria drug. And it's got some pretty, in fact, the doctor at Highbury said, as where I was living at the time, said, well, I, I recommend you take Larium. Now, it, it has to it gives you nightmares and makes you depressed. And I, I, I mean, naively, I mean, or, or crazily, thought, oh, well, that'll make interesting writing, <laughs> you know, whatever, <laughs> I won't get malaria. <laughs> So I, I went over to uh, Kinshasa in sort of towards the end of July um, and I'd already been called by the International Red Cross telling me to cancel my journey because the um, civil war had broken out. And of course, you know, civil war, I mean, that, that was a story. Do you know what I mean? That was, a, that was a, certainly a news angle, you know, and, uh, and I had a letter from the Observer newspaper and I also had a letter from a, a photo agency saying that we're, we're interested in, you know, Stuart Griffiths' work, blah, blah, blah. And I got them fab blonde, you know, coated in plastic, and uh, they become my letters of introduction, which really helped me out because um, I, I was there for about three weeks. This was taken in the Diplomat Hotel early on. So by the time you got there, your connection with the Red Cross had just well, dissipated. So I, I, got into this, I got into this hotel and I tried to ring. I uh, thought the phone lines had been cut. Um, and then when I did get through, I was told that the um, they'd all evacuated. And I was like, ah, you know, what do I do? So I thought, oh, well, I better just try and make some, some use of this. So I, I 
I moved to another hotel. This is like sort of me moving about in Mr. John's taxi. Um, I moved about, uh, moved around, uh, and moved to another hotel, and I got, I got, I got um, to know some English-speaking people who come from Sudan and uh, this this electrician from Spain, and uh, and then I got to know this uh, Congolese priest, and uh, he said, "You just need a photo permit, simple as that." You know, it's, it, 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 I'll, I'll help you with that. Of course, week in, week out. Of course, I mean, it was worse than a Franz Kafka novel, and. Uh, Eventually, when I got my photo permit sorted, and I and I was I was I was actually at this place here, the stadium, and uh, and then I was I was all these soldiers were running, and I was got the old like and I'd taken these pictures, and they're actually uh, I was thinking what they're running towards because they was having a pro Kabila rally here, and uh, but they actually run to me and they just whacked me in the head with their rifle, and, and I was pinned on the ground, and uh, all these rifles at my head, and then taken through all these jeering crowds, and uh, and it was like one of the really bad films you know when it all goes really 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 horribly wrong for the for the photo journalist <laughs> concerned you know and uh and, it, and, it, and that, oh, the crowd turned on you and spitting and throwing things and uh taken through mock executions and uh and, and then dragged back to the ministry of information interrogated and but yeah for about two days i was i was imprisoned mm-hmm. and then then released um the british embassy said they were about f- about 15 minutes behind me, but they would say that. But so I was released and then I was taken at gunpoint to my very uh, modest hotel room in, in the guest house. And, uh, and then I eventually evacuated with the Spanish embassy after seeing the Spanish ambassador. And um, yeah. That was said, a really, uh, pretty traumatic experience, Stuart. Yeah, yeah, it was. I think what well, is traumatic. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of traumatic experiences especially, you know, during my time in, in, in Northern Ireland. But what I think was most traumatic about uh, being in the Congo was, was I was on my own. Yeah, so I was about to say, you're completely just out on a limb, aren't you? You've had the support of your other, whatever organisation you've been with, maybe that's the army or whatever else, but to be out there by yourself, no yeah. contact. Because, you know, I mean, we were taking, like, you know, in the like SUVs, you know, into the, the dark, you know, no lights, and you're just thinking, I'm... I'm going to die now. <laughs> you know, just put in a ditch and forgotten about. You know, it's. But anyway, yeah, it was it, it was it was quite a journey, and um, I, I live to tell the tale. But there's, there, you can see it on um, on and the the Vice published it back in 2012. If, if you just type Vice Stuart Griffiths Congo, we can read um, the whole dispatch <laughs> if you want to. Um, sure. So, so anyway, I, I I kind of returned to um, yeah back to back to the UK. Didn't really know where I was going, and uh, a friend of mine, this guy in particular, said, "Well, who had the land in Portugal, which I mentioned about when I was stopping over on the way to Kinshasa." I said, "Look, I, I'm really going to take you up on that. I'd really like to go over. I mean, my I, I suffered, um, I had terrible scabies and eczema and." And I was just a complete nervous wreck, really, from from the larium, the not what knowing what I was going to do. I was living in kind of like these these derelict sort of rundown pubs. By this guy I knew from Newry in Northern Ireland, uh, and you know I was even contemplating going back in the military. It was it was 1999 was a quite an interesting year in that that respect. And uh, anyway, this this guy. Um, to come over and I, I live I lived in Portugal where I, I did I did take some photographs but I was more into kind of writing really I, I, I thought I was like you know Jack Kerouac you know on the road you know I'd gone to live in a caravan in the mountains and uh, work on farms and and then when that work dried up I went down to the Algarve to work and uh, you know in the bars and stuff like that and uh, did you find that you were writing we were like sort of supporting your photographic work as well were you keeping journals or something well i think the writing was really the journal and yeah. because what happened after the congo um uh journey i took i i published my i mean it was two days but they 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 you know they're like they always edit things they call it my 30 hour hell under under kabila's henchmen and uh so for 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 a brief moment i thought oh i can write <laughs> you know and I was reading a lot of books and, and I was kind of a bit 
because even when I when I evacuated back from the Congo and I was crossing the Congo River, and it was amazing, you know, on this boat. But I'd had so much crap. I mean, I'd even managed to get what films I took. I just smuggled them out, which was really, 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 really problematic. And so when I remember sit, being there with my camera bag and I couldn't physically take my camera out of the camera bag because I'd lost the whole will to, to, to take pictures. It, 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 uh, it spun me out so much. that I experienced. Stuart, Stuart yeah. can, I just, can I just interrupt? We've got a couple of, couple of questions in the chat. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Um, first of all, Dana wants to know, are you getting paid for all these photography trips? Um, back then, the Congo trip, no. And I'll tell you how that the Congo trip came about. Um, I funded that, but it was funded by selling my, um, which is quite an interesting point because it all interlink, interlinks. The pictures I took of, of from Albania and also the pictures I took which I kept from my second tour in Northern Ireland as a unit photographer. I sold to the Imperial War Museum uh, for about 1,500 quid. Um, and I actually look at it now and think that's kind of remarkable because they never pay anyone for anything, but they really wanted these pictures in their collection. And they certainly didn't, I would not give them the negatives. And apparently uh, uh, George Rogers, Rogers' son uh, uh, printed them up something because i know some photographers are a bit and i go why didn't i print them up you know blah blah blah. But anyway you know that's just another so the money i got from the imperial war museum funded the congo trip and what what year was that that would have been that was 1998 so 1500 pounds is worth a lot more than then than it is now yeah so I, it cost about 900 pound for the uh, ticket yeah so um, and that's why one of the reasons why when he, they rung me up and said cancel your trip because i knew if i cancelled it i wouldn't get a refund no way um sean has got a question about insurance did, did you have your photography equipment insured for these trips abroad and if so can you no. recommend an insurance company no okay that's a nice simple answer is that because at the time you it, it, it didn't cross your mind or is it something that you would do now it's it's something that i and I'll get to, to that uh, later on because it, 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 I had this attitude, if, if they take the cameras, then they, they take me. It's, it's, you know, the cameras were part of me. I, I guard these for my life. Um, I mean, they did smash the Leica up in, in the Congo. And, uh, I mean, they looked at Rolleiflex and just thought, what, 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 you know, this is this some antique or something. And... Um, and they actually, I remember the, 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 some guy at the Ministry of Information who said, you actually sounded very much like Darth Vader. Say, so, uh, <laughs> only the top journalists come here, Mr. Griffiths. And I thought, <laughs> you know, you know, whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's, and this is where the military thing comes in. It's like, and that's one of the things they probably were a bit wary of because they kept saying, are you ex-military? You know, and... Um, yeah, well, on that, on that topic... I kept denying it. I kept denying it. Well. On that topic, Scott wants to know, did being a para and your training to, uh, to be in the military help you in that, uh, particularly in the Congo situation? Well, I, I would say most definitely in terms of just kind of, you know, persevering and getting through a, a serious problem like that. Um, and, you know, even trying to keep a sense of... of you know, focus. I wouldn't say sense of humour because I certainly wasn't laughing afterwards. Um, but mm. um, yeah, I mean, mo most definitely. Um, uh, and in fact, even when when the uh, the Observer article came out, they said, um, "Well, we've got to put you down as something," you know, because you know, as if to say nobody knows who you are, nobody really cares. Um, and they put in there, he, you know, he graduated from university and is an ex paratrooper. And I just thought, thanks a lot for that. You know, it's, you know, I'm going to look like some just crazy kind of, you know, person chasing war. Um, but yeah, in terms of my own self resilience and, uh, and, 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 and just, you know, getting through it. I mean, I remember being interrogated for uh, quite some time and they were going on and I could see my passport on the desk and they say, well, you know, we, you know, and they start making all the, I said, well, it's right there, you know, you know, these little things. And, and obviously, you know, holding, you know, 
weapons that you throw and, and all this. And uh, But also when I was taken through a, a mock execution as well, knowing what it sounds like when a round goes into a chamber, um, mm. there's a distinctive kind of clunk sound. And I knew these Congolese troops were just trying to make me piss my pants. And uh, But I wasn't going to let them know that. Do you know what I mean? But, mm. yeah, uh, it's... Um, yeah, yeah. I, I personally think it, it certainly helped um, in, in them circumstances. Okay, we've got a few questions coming in now. John wants to know, um, he said, he said you mentioned there was a stigma around war photography in the 90s. Yeah, like, yeah, why, yeah. Why do, you think, why, why do you think that existed? I, I think, the, I mean, I wouldn't, people like Don McCullen then weren't seen as particularly cool people. Uh, or even Tim Page and all that, and all these people I, I was, you know, I thought were great, you know, and uh, I think Philip Jones Griffiths was probably an exception because he was, he was, you know, he was a firmly established magnum for some, but it, it was like, you know, the, the train of thought in my time at university at Brighton, you know, everyone was, it was all Martin Parr. Now, Martin's a great guy and, you know, I, and I understand um, is, is, you know, method in what he does and I actually find it very interesting but there was a kind of there was a kind of conflict I, I certainly saw between you know the, the Martin Parr camp and the Philip Jones Griffiths camp if you know what I mean and, and to sort of openly admit that you was a war photographer meant that you were because you know war was obscene war was disgusting war was you know horrible you know this that you know and and you know I remember hearing this thing of how they would say so these photographers like James Knack who he would go into these war zones and create these beautiful pictures on suffering. You know, it was, you know, maybe it came, became more of an ethical thing. Yeah, um, it was an ethical conversation at the time, wasn't it? It was a hot topic and almost yeah. seen as like a bit of like dinosaurs or most of the past part of yeah, documentary like, photography had moved on. Yeah, and this whole thing of black and white reportage, it was, you know, it was, it was yeah, it was seen as a bit of a dinosaur of, you know. Do you think maybe, maybe uh, people have become a bit more desensitised to, to, to images like that? Because um, with, 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 with media, with social media and with the internet and the, and the vast amount of um, documentaries and, and even in, um, war films that we see, do you think people might have become a bit desensitised to the, to the shocking nature of them? Probably have. And, you know, it's like I was, you know, when I started to, to, to do pictures of, you know, injured soldiers and stuff, it would be a case of, you know, he's got X amount missing limbs and then, you know, someone would say, well, have you seen such and such a picture in America? He's only got half a head, you know. Mm. It's, it's, it was, you know, the, the, the whole thing of, you know, how far do you need to go to, uh, and, uh, and then I think it became important because it's all about context, isn't it? It's about, you know, you know, what is it you're saying and why you're saying it? You know, mm. what's your reason? I mean, it's a bit like with, with in, in doing my PhD where I come across so many people um, who are, are very concerned about military issues, you know, I think, well, what's, what's, why, you know, why do you give a shit? You know, do you know what I mean? It's, it's mm. um, because, because obviously it was something personal to me. And that's, for me, a lot of the work that I've done is, is been, you know, personal. So, I mean, I mean, the Congo was something out there and it was my, you know, a, a kind of moment in time where I just wanted to kind of get into that NGO kind of uh, work ethic, if you like. And, uh, and it, it, it became really, when I actually think about a total failure, do you know what I mean? But yeah. it, it, it's become part of my narrative, if you like. Well, you know, well, well, John, John also says that he, he, he always felt that war and military photography to be the most compelling and visceral. That's what John says. Um, now, you, you said personal, uh, made a personal reference there, which leads me on to Rebecca's question. Looking at your past photographs, how do you feel when you look at them? Does, do they not give you some sort of, she says, post-traumatic stress disorder? Um, What's it like? I, I, it is sometimes, you know, kind of going over that. I mean, I, I've just been at a conference this morning, actually, with King's College Veterans Mental Health, <laughs> you know, 
And one of the problems is is with with veterans, especially after they've been diagnosed with PTSD, is to to keep retelling the the narrative. Um, but you know, they, this is what you know being a photographer is about, really. And uh, I kind of yeah, it, it can be a, you know a little bit you know brings back things in the subconscious news, mm-hmm. but you know in dreams and stuff like that. But that's this is the this is kind of part, you know this is really my the life that I kind of I wouldn't mm-hmm. say chose but it's it's certainly you know my photography journey yeah um, well and, I I wasn't expecting your photographs of ravers uh, because that's kind of my uh, background they were really good actually it took me back maybe not in a post traumatic stress disorder fashion but it certainly took yeah. me back to <laughs> but on on that topic you said you used to go to these raves when you were down in in the south near Colchester do you think because of what the the, eight, the 90s rave culture scene was like, that was an escape, a proper escape from being in the military? Oh, most definitely. Um, our, you know, I, I remember, um, I think that's one of the, yeah, it was that. I remember going to Wigan Pier as well. Oh. And I remember mm. um, thinking, uh, oh, what, what, what's, all, what's all this about? And then wait, the next minute when it's, you know, the medication kicked in, so to speak. <laughs> I was, uh, I thought, wow, this is fantastic. You know, everyone's great. This is brilliant because, you know, you know, especially being in the parents, you know, in, in, you know, during that time, we were really quite aggressive. We were trained to be mm. very aggressive. It was very, uh, you know, there was a, there was a reason why for that. So that was like the kind of polar opposite, if you like. And absolutely, and you can see why, the politi- yeah. see why the politicians got really uptight about yeah. it. Absolutely, weren't making any money out of alcohol because you didn't want to drink alcohol either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dana would like to ask if you what advice you'd give to any aspiring war photographers. Um, wow, well, advice to, to aspiring war photographers. Uh, I, 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 to be honest, I can imagine. It's, um, I mean, it's such a problematic thing now, isn't it? Um, I mean, you know, because for, for for a long time, I had this this whole thing of, of of wanting to do that, and then now it's become such a controlled environment with its embed system and all that. Um, um, I don't, I don't, it, it's it's a difficult one because I know how difficult it is, and I. You know, in one side they say, "Oh, that's that's it's, it's great that you did that," but you know, I was on. I didn't have any family or kids. In fact, the last time I went to anywhere remotely dodgy was 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 Baghdad in in two thousand and five, and I just said, you know, I'm, I remember being, um, you know, listening to Forces Radio, and uh, there was like a little girl saying, "Oh, I'm, I miss your daddy. I hope you're building big sand castles." And, and I just thought my daughter, you know, my daughter was born that year. Was there. I just thought, what am I doing here? What am I doing this for? You know what I mean? And I thought, well, well, if if you are going to go to places, that make sure you get a guarantee from someone, and 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 make sure because you don't want to do all that just to just to put on Instagram. Do you know what I mean? It's um, mm-hmm. and so yeah, it, it's 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 a difficult it's a difficult difficult one because it's all about access i mean you know you could try the roots of ngos and all that kind of carry on and uh, but yeah I'm, i'd say my, my advice is, is to have make sure you have a very good notebook of contacts and yeah. people who, who people you can you can you can you can trust and and just know that when when you know the the shit is the fan that you uh you've, you've kind of got like uh, some backup um Okay. I, I, well, wouldn't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't um, recommend, you know, things I've done to 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 anyone. You know. Yeah. What the raving or the war? I'm only kidding. No, the, no, um, the, the, so... the raving. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I right. Go into the yeah to, to these these yeah especially like places like the Democratic Republic of Congo is. Uh, I mean, I, I think I think maybe that was the kind of lure because it was it, it was always known as famously difficult. And, okay. And you were, you know, you had this. Oh, it'll be okay, you know. But it wasn't. It was. It was. It was. It was very difficult, very traumatic. Although I'd like to return one day, you know. Why not? <laughs> you know. Pat Patrick's got a question that you're probably going to lead up to if you if you kind of go 
Um, you can either answer it now or you or it might you might be leading up to it. But Patrick wants to know how you ended up getting um, stuff commissioned and, and working with big uh, newspapers. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, I'll I'll sort of go go for this. This is like yeah. I said, the, the, uh, the yeah. Board. Carry on. Yeah. And, and th this picture in particular was was Shoreham Docks, where again we're going back to them rave times. And you might be interesting, Graham. But this was Shoreham Docks, and by 1999, it certainly wasn't very nice. And uh, the kind of the love kind of ecstasy thing was replaced by people just zoned out on ketamine to be honest and uh, it was it was awful and uh, and obviously I was not in a great place after coming back from the Congo and, and for me this picture kind of summed up the kind of whole depressing November winter what am I going to do kind of carry on and anyway so yeah, to how I kind of got commissioned and, and, and noticed uh, after coming you know uh, going to Brighton I got evicted from Brighton but I, would, I was offered a job at a photo agency in um, in central London I think the advert said photo journalist wanted for top photo agency in London please ring such and such a number so I rung the number I went to go and see them and the organization I don't know you might know this one Steve but it was big pictures it was just no, a papar papar paparazzi agency and I thought well and it didn't take me long to suss out, you know, what kind of uh, organisation this was. I mean, the guy who run it, he worked for the Daily Mail. He said, yeah, mate, I was a war photographer. I was out in Bosnia, mate, you know, all this. And I thought, yeah, yeah, OK. Uh, but it was a job. I, I, I remember coming out of the office and seeing someone from the Magnum office and saying, well, I've just been offered a job. And he said, oh, that's fantastic. You know, I said, well, it's not great. It's paparazzi work. But uh, he said, well, it's, it's, it's photography, you know. And, uh, and I thought, well, yeah, that's right. So I was photographing the rich and famous in the evening um, as a paparazzi. And then I would uh, a few weeks of, of sort of street living on the street and then living in backpacker hostels. And I found a, um, about a veterans hostel in East London where because I had nowhere to live. So I uh, this 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 is the television room uh, image of it. And um, so that was my base. So I I'd, I'd returned there and you know, six o'clock in the morning and then, and, uh, photograph the residents there and, uh, and then go and photograph the rich and famous. But, um, that's how I kind of got on the ladder, if you like, because I started to get things published. All right. There were tabloid newspapers, you know, Madonna coming out of cabaret or, you know, this, that, or, uh, in fact, the first paparazzi picture, which is quite interesting, especially because I, I'm an avid reader of newspapers. It's like some kind of weird thing that I do, but my first paparazzi job was Prince Andrew. <laughs> you know, and uh so so once i got all the cuttings together i then started to approach the news agencies so i then started to work for the associated press press association and a couple of jobs with afp but i mean these organizations they'll get you all over the world brilliant but they will retain your copyright so I, I mean, this goes back to my days in the military. Mm. You know, my pictures are my photographs, they're my copyright, they're my negatives. And so you've got to ask yourself, what do you want? Do you, do you, want, um, do you want to go all around the world doing things for the, 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 the kind of the press machine or, or do you want to retain, you know, you know, authorship of your work? And so anyway, so that's how it kind of happened for me in the, uh, in the publishing world. And... I um that hostel I was living, I returned to it in 2003, 2004 to take portraits of, of the residents there because the Sunday Mirror, who I was then getting regular work for, um, they wanted me to go to Iraq. And I was thinking, brilliant, at last I'm going to go to, you know, do this war thing that I've always wanted to do. Anyway, they sent me on some biochem course, which, you know, how, how to put a respirator on your head and stuff like that and block bang rub with, uh, you know, should you get attacked by chemicals, which was, was all pretty, I knew all this stuff anyway from my army days. And, uh, and um, when it came for me to go and I was one of the last people to sort of be sent, um, they decided not to send me in the end because Terry Lloyd had been killed by a blue on blue thing. He was an ITN news reporter. And I was thinking, um, brilliant, fantastic. In fact, I always remember the words after that when I, when I knew I wasn't being sent. They said, we're not sending any more to people to Iraq. We're just going to do all-out shagging stories. 
because that's what people want. We don't want to know about the war. And again, the Mirror Group with Piers Morgan, they had this this very anti-Iraq war stance, uh, which it caught up with. Um, it was very much part of his downfall um, from his fall of grace at the, the, the editor of the, the Mirror. But that's another story. But I returned to the hostel to do these portraits and interviews uh, of the residents. And um, these were published in the Guardian newspaper on the 5th of May, 2005. And it was a cover story in the society section. So they gave it a really good spread. I mean, I had, even had phone calls from the Mirror, uh, Sunday Mirror picture desk saying, I've seen your pictures, they're really great. And I was thinking, yeah, and, you know, what's what? And he said, well, I'll just ring it to just congratulate you, which you don't get much congratulation uh, in, in the press or media world. You know, it, I mean, the fact that they published it is the congratulation, if you like. So I kind of used that moment to uh, carry on with this, 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 you know, personal project on veterans and, and obviously that the homeless issue was talked about but no one had actually done anything and I because I'd lived there I was one able to I had all these photographs from when I was there but also I could get access into it despite the fact that uh, the hostel said when I approached them to do this body of work um, on the place the the, uh, the colonel in charge the ex pay corps turned around and said well the answer is no Mr Griffiths because at the heart of every journalist there's deceit <laughs> photograph them outside the hostel but not inside so that's what I did I just photographed them outside and um, yeah I'll go back to that actually and um, yeah I mean this guy in particular James you can see his wings on his uh, on his arm again it was the kind of airborne brotherhood thing which you know going back to that military thing and how it helped yes it did but, is it uh, um, sorry is it, is it important that you get these images across to kind of reflect how veterans often get treated, you know, how, how they don't. Well, I, how... I, yeah, I felt it important because my argument was, and how I actually placed this in the Guardian was, was I saw an article um, in the Guardian about how Nick Griffin from the British National Party was using homeless veterans mm. as a political statement for their British National Party. And I, rung the, the Guardian editor and said, this is absurd. I've been doing all this work, blah, blah, blah. I don't support the British National Party. I don't support, Nick. you know, anyway. So they called me into the office and I showed them a portfolio and they just went, we're going to give it a massive spread because it was a story which lots had been going on about, but no one had. And also for me, it was, it was to basically say, well, we've sent all these troops into Iraq and these are the soldiers that have done wars previously. And look how their lives have panned out. They're living in a homeless hostel. They've got problems. So I was ineffectively talking about the hidden wounds and, and PTSD and traumas and all that before before many w w were doing anything on that. And yeah. I will say that with, with conviction as well, because I was doing work well before this Help for Heroes came about. And I, and I know for a fact of, with the Help for Heroes, because... I did a portrait of a CEO of a, of a homeless veterans charity with a journalist from the Sun newspaper. And she said, oh, yes, we're setting up this new charity called, you know, Help for Heroes and uh, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just going to go up to Liverpool to go and photograph this guy. And I said, oh, I've already photographed him. And she was very pissed off. But that was, <laughs> but anyway, that will come up later. But uh, yeah, um, so yeah, it was, it was, you know, although I didn't get, to photograph the wars and I realise over time why because if I'd have been a you know a, a kind of you know Queen's Commission in the army you know mm. it would have been a, a lot different and I knew that even though when you've got newspapers like The Sun and everything who kind of give it this way they're working they, they're not they're all run by very very high echelon public school mm. people it's it's and I saw it for a Right there, because I was on the desk. I was seeing, you know, I mean, even with, um, I mean, this was 2004, which would have been, it was an interesting year because that was the, uh, um, yeah, when Piers Morgan did them pictures of the, uh, you know, the Iraqi, uh, the British soldier urinating on the Iraqi prisoner of war. And I turned yeah. around, said to the, to the Sun picture desk, I said, these pictures are fake. 
because of you know this 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 anyway they ran the story and then sooner soon you know sooner you know, after about a couple of weeks then Piers was removed from his uh, his office um, yeah this kind of links in hannah's asked a question that links in quite well here she says how do you feel um when you see how war is documented and uh, by journalists who don't understand or have as much knowledge about the military as you do that kind of links in with what you've just said actually um it used to make me quite angry and it was one of my motivators to do what I did working within the press to try and get the narrative right and try and manage it in a way. Um, because you are, you've got a lot of journalists who, you know, for them, cause it's, it, it's like the kind of thing that we, you know, you know, before we started thinking about the ethics of it, they think it's kind of glamorous and, and, and all these things. And, but over time I thought, well, you know, the old whole kind of um, that whole thing of wanting to do that, I realised that the, the, the homecoming story was 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 just as important. And yeah, it's it, and, and now I've, I've done a, you know, I, I took and when I was um, offered the, the PhD scholarship at Ulster, they said, well, why do you want to do a PhD? I said, well, I want to it'll give me some some authority on on what I'm doing, because I know from my own experience and also from photographing injured veterans and stuff that because you're talking about military discourse, you become, you, you come across the, the walls of bureaucracy quite often, you know, it's, it's an area which, I mean, even when I did the piece in the guardian, which this picture appeared in, the MOD were, 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 were fuming. And I know that because the CEO at one of these, um, veterans hostels told me he said you know he said you know you've really really ruffled the feathers of the MOD and he said but that's a good thing because it's it's put it into the public you know in, into the public arena it, it isn't just sort of brushed under the carpet and not talked about so in terms of even when I when I was at the uh, the King's College Mental Health Conference today there are all these things set up and it's I'm not sort of saying I'm I'm part of that but I think my photography could have been part of some of, to make these things have changed, you know. And uh, so, yeah, they, they do annoy me, actually. Um, and when I was working at the because because of what happened at the Sunday Mirror, I then started working at the Sun, thinking that a newspaper that uh, backed our boys, I would I would get sent somewhere. And I, I remember saying to the picture editor, could I, I'd like to go to Iraq? And he said, I don't want your death on my conscience. And that was that was it. And then Rupert Hamer at the Mirror. Sunday Mirror called me up and said, I'm, I've just been appointed a defence correspondent and uh, I'd like you to come over me. He said, well, I work at the Sun now. But anyway, Rupert was killed in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan and the photographer who was working with him lost both his legs. So, you know, when you, people go on about doing conflict work, it really is dangerous stuff, you know, and, and I think journalists, I mean, the romanticised version and vision of of, of of, of, of uh, photojournalism in war was, is Vietnam. And that was a long time ago. Uh, now you're a mo more of a target than the, uh, the soldiers now because you, you generate more news coverage. More news, yeah. yeah. You know I mean, if you, if you, if you get abducted as a, as a journalist, uh, you know, and you know, it's going to, you know, more so than a soldier. It's like, well, yeah, just a soldier. Cares, yeah. It doesn't you know? matter where you're from. It will go around the world. Yeah. So you got a bigger price on your head as a, as a journalist now. So um, yeah, I think it's thinking of, of different ways to, you know, talk about them things. And also, it's really really costly as well. I mean, I mean, when I was in Iraq, which I'll, I'll go into the next picture here, um, 2005, because like I say, when I was photographing the hostel that I published in the Guardian, now the hostel said, right, whatever you do, never let Griffiths back in. So I was banned from the hostel from that moment on, which, you know, fair enough. So I then started to do, uh, think of uh, other other avenues. I mean, I did care homes up in Glasgow and stuff like that. And, uh, and um, I stopped working at the Sun. They stopped giving me work in November, the end of November. And I started working in private security briefly. And part of that was getting to know people who were working, um, who had... Um, things out in Baghdad and uh, I went out there in 2000 and sort of towards the end of 2005 uh, a friend of mine had a, a garage in the international zone and I wasn't even insured 
The insurance alone was for someone like myself was 150 pound a day. Now, if you're not getting funded for something like this, it's like, whoa, you know, and it is a bit of a gamble. But I mean, this person in particular, I, I knew his father, he was uh, ex parachute regiment and um, worked out in Angola during the uh, 70s. Um, and this is this is his son. And so the people I was working with, I knew anyway. And uh, and I mean, it was it was hairy. I mean, you'd go down Route Irish and you'd hear the, the, the armoured vehicle, these little taps, you know, where you're getting shot at. And you're thinking, bloody hell, you know. Um, and then there was a moment when these turned around and said, well, we're going to go into lockdown now. So you either leave now or you, you won't leave till February. So I decided to cut short my Baghdad trip and uh, just get home, really. Uh, and like, like a... I might have mentioned, uh, well, I mentioned certainly this was all before Facebook. So when I was over there, the amount of people I met from my, you know, parachute regiment days was phenomenal. It was like friends reunited. It was, it was, it was, it's like bloody hell, it's such, all right, how's it going? And of course I had the old, the old attire I used to wear. I mean, I still wear the similar clothing now. I've not really changed much fashion since. Uh, but there was like people like winking going, all right, mate, you know, old school, you know what I mean? I, was, I thought it was really funny, you know. And uh, yeah, it was, but again, it was, it was, uh, you know, when I got over to Kuwait, it was, I managed to uh, get an extension on my overdraft <laughs> there and then. And it was, I mean, talk about being on the edge, you know, hopefully, uh, I like to think that I've, I'm, I'm, you know, calming down a bit now with, uh, but it, it was pretty high octane stuff sometimes. That was Baghdad, and and then decided to kind of work a bit more near, uh, you know, more of the UK. Um, and this you, is when I started the start of working with um, with Vice. This is when, I, yeah, well, this initially because uh, sort of after the Baghdad thing, um, uh, I then started to get commissions with the Sunday Times magazine, um, and I, I did a thing to coincide with the 25th anniversary of the Falklands War. Also, um, I, I show my portfolio to of, of injured uh, soldiers to to uh, to Vice, and they wanted me to do a fashion show of, of, of it. You know, so I went around the country with a bag of uh, American apparel, plastic bag of of clothes for them to wear. Which, to begin with, I thought was I thought this is really absurd. But um, I thought, well, it's a new client. I mean, my wife, who's a photographer too, she said, just go with it. It's uh, you know, it's a new client, and. Around that time, I'd been commissioned by the Sunday Times magazine to do a, a piece in response to the Reese Jones murder and uh, on, on gangs in Liverpool um, with, with a crime writer. Anyway, uh, the story was commissioned, and uh, but the picture editor was away. And, uh, and when I actually she came back from Holland, she said, "Well, I knew nothing of this," and uh, and it was just basically curtailed. So I took that put this portfolio. This this is one of the photographs. To, to device and show them and they and then they ran a story and that's what kind of started the relationship with vice and i worked with them yeah you know, since since 2007 up to uh 2008 um and again this this was sort of around that time with the sunday times so this is then going back did stuff on on combat stress television rooms which was this was part of the sunday times commission um and then the injured soldiers that I was doing, which was uh, part of the Sunday Times. So yeah, the Sunday Times thing was very much 2007 and that led on to Vice. And uh, it was great to, 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 to be involved with, you know, uh, a kind of new magazine, if you like, who had them who kind of had the balls to sort of, you know, push the boundaries. And uh, it was a great moment in time. So this was, this was Andy. Uh, and then Craig in Liverpool, which this picture in particular, how I got in touch with Craig was from when I did the gang photographs. So I was in a meeting with some someone uh, in a cab and then he mentioned, oh, do you know, such and such a blood, you know, and, and this is how it kind of works. You know, it's one thing leads on to the other. So so going back to that question about what would you advise, I always keep a notebook and pen with you. You know, you never know who you're going to meet. 
and then there was Jamie in Bristol, which he'd been known in the press anyway for being the youngest soldier to be injured in the Iraq war, but no one had photographed him with his top off. And the reason why I photographed him with his top off, because again, being an ex-soldier, he was going, oh, do you want to see my scars? I'm like, well, go on then, you know, let's, let's have a look at your scars, you know? And uh, so for him, the, 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 his, um, you know, interaction with me and, and our interaction was, was like soldier to soldier, if you like, you know, my scars bigger than your scar sort of thing. And do you know what I mean? It's uh, meanwhile, you set a camera up and uh, <clears throat> 2008, I, I, Moved out of London. I was living in South London and uh, obviously the credit crash didn't help. And I moved to Hastings with my family and uh, I was working for a uh, sort of local news agency, if you like, doing a bit of work for them. Well, working on the Sundays, really, which I hated. And uh, I, I knew about this guy, Martin Compton, who'd, uh, who'd um, gone to the High Court over his injuries and he hadn't been, you know, got, got the right compensation. So I mess up with him and he told me about this, this trip. He was going, he was going to New York to do a charity walk for his charity during veterans, uh, veterans day parade. And uh, so I secured a few guarantees with the help of a, a journalist. And we, I went over to New York, New York. I'd never been to New York in my life. And um, it's funny. I don't know if you know the story here, but um, Alex Soff, was commissioned by the Brighton Photo Biennale to do a set of pictures. And he came over from to a UK airport and he said, well, who are you? He says, I'm Alex Soff. I'm a Magnum photographer. I'm doing all this. He said, well, have you got a work permit? And he said, no. He said, well, you can't take any photos then. You know, tough shit. Now, when I went to New York, I didn't go over and say, hi, I'm Stuart Griffiths. I'm a photojournalist. <laughs> I just kept well Stump about anything. Why, I, had, yeah. I had a little, I had a little like a camera, a little backpack. I had my address of where I was going to. You don't know, you don't, you haven't seen me, right? And that's it. I was in, an, and, and uh, I ended up in Mayor Bloomberg's office, and all sorts of things. It was, it was amazing the, the access I got, um, because I was with with, with Martin and his entourage, and uh, and I just got as much photos done as possible and it's this to me is probably the most poignant of, of photos and it has been used it was used in the isolation film it was used in uh, Susanna Burnoff's uh, portraits of violence uh, publication and this is kind of going this is sort of away from Manhattan if you like going kind of you know sort of up to kind of Harlem way that sort of way and that's where all the better photographs were you know away from the kind of all the posh snobbery of whatever, whatever it was, it was, but it was amazing. I, I thoroughly loved it. I remember calling my wife and she said, you said, you said, you sounded really happy out there. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, I really liked um, it. Scott, Scott uh, has got a question that ties in quite well with this image, actually. How does the story of the veteran impact on the image that you create of them? How does the story, impact on the image the story of the veteran does that impact on the image uh, well I mean this image for example I mean it's I kind of think it says it all really you know apart from the fact that it's got American flags there um, how does it, how does it, what does it do, just to so rephrase that question does he say how is it impacting the veteran himself when these pictures no, been shown? individuals story how does that impact on how you depict them how you represent them in the picture um how does it impact or do you just document what you see well i i just document um it's it's not i mean i mean i could set things up um you know like i remember going to an advertising agency saying well, yeah it's brilliant you know these gang pictures could you, could you do that and set that up i said well yeah um How's it? I, 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 can you say the question again? Because I'm trying to sort of try to try and work yeah, this I, question out. How, how he's written it out, how he's written it is, how does the stories of the veterans impact on the images you create of them? Unless Scott, unless you want oh, okay, to. Okay, okay. I, I, would, I would say. Um, I need to ask it for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say. Well, I know some, some of the people who I photographed and how their images has is, is, is come out, and, and it's. It's 
it's been good for them and they've had you know positive things happen from 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 that um, and so so in terms of impact in the individual this, this been a, i mean this guy in particular had been in the press a lot anyway um he'd um it been to the high court which you know you've got all the the, the the high court photographers there and everything like that um some of the ones that are probably not so well known um you know, there's ones that who, who've not even looking at the camera. It's taking the back backs of the heads and stuff like that. Um, but I, th I think, in terms of impacting them, or uh, how the stories impact, uh, well, this was never used in any newspapers or, or, or Sunday Times. This is more, and this is interesting when we talk about reoccurring themes and 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 how images that get used and and what becomes, you know an image that gets used and used over and over again. Most of them images that get used over and over again come from the wire services, like, say, for for example, the uh, the, the girl running from the napalm um, um, thing in, in Vietnam. You know, it goes onto the, onto the AP news wire. It, it, it then becomes part of the subconscious, like Eddie Adams' picture of, 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 of shooting, you know, a Viet Cong person. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's the uses and uses and usage. And, uh, I mean, I'd like you know, to, to say that, you know, things could be, I mean, this is why, you know, with, with some photographers is getting um, agency is really important because, the, again, it's about the usages of that and, and the vehicle to do it. As, as a uh, independent photographer on your own, it's it's not easy to, to do that, you know. And uh, so it becomes a kind of need to know basis, really. Uh, and how, you know, I mean, when I look at uh, books on, soldiers photographs for example and they'll they'll go on about no, no one was critical about the iraq war well i was on cnn news and all sorts of stuff you know it's it's down to the researcher really um i i think um so yeah i mean how th that being down to the researcher and how that impacts the veteran the fact that they were willing to be photographed in the first place means that their exception. I've never had any, um, uh, you know, when they've said, "Oh, I don't like what you've done." Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's always been kosher, if you like. Do you know what I mean? For them, they've, you know, I've shown them what what, what was happening. They, they were part of the process, if you like, you know, and uh, they wouldn't have invited me in otherwise. So you touched on it earlier, and it's I know it's linked with this image. So how did it um, your practice sort of move on, and how did it become involved with the making of the? isolation film well the isolation film um that obviously luke seymour and joseph ball they'd um, seen my work in various places in fact they said that they first saw my work in photo 8 magazine uh, which was uh, a photo essay i did on um, on a on an abandoned housing state in in south shields and and they had an idea to do something on a photographer. So I met up with them and uh, again, I took my portfolio of images and uh, they, uh, you know, saw that. And uh, and then again, it was just sort of a slow process to begin with. And and then they, uh, it was around the time I moved uh, to, to Hastings and I thought, well, just go for it, have a go. And uh, it was revisited in a lot of places that had already been and photographed and all that. and. Uh, so I, uh, so we just just got on with it really, and um, and it was yeah, it was it was soon after I came back from 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 taking this photograph in New York, and um, and it's just a case of like making the most of of, of these situations. Like I say, like the portal opens, the people are interested, and you say, well, okay, let's 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 work, let's see what we can do, and uh, but it, how that film came about was there was no budget or anything; it was all on a shoestring. And there were just people that obviously they were trying to get themselves known in, 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 a, in a way. I mean, it was premiered at the Edinburgh Film Festival, which was, was great. I mean, I traveled up on a National Express coach and I had a broken arm, you know, and uh, so. <laughs> it's... Before, so just before you talk about the documentary, um, and cause I'm just aware of the time as well. Uh, uh, Dana's got a really great poignant comment on that picture. She says, 
I think seeing the comparison of a soldier in healthy in a healthy, thriving community like this photo has an emotional impact because it shows what he sacrificed for that community to exist and a true image that speaks without the need for words. I think that's a really poignant comment on well, that's, that. That's very, uh, that's very kind. Thank you. Yeah. That's from Dana. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> well, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. That's, uh... but yeah, I, you know, we keep in touch and, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, he's got an okay life. And, and then many of these, you know, ones that have got the visible scars, they've, because, because it's very visual, um, you know, it, it's, it's, they're, they're, you know, obviously they've, you know, they've, they've got that to live with, but, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was great that the, you know, they let me come along basically. And, um, he, he seems to be doing okay. And, uh, nowadays and, and many others have, 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 you know, they've become kind of poster boys for various military charities and stuff like that, you know, brilliant. Good luck to him. Do you know what I mean? It's, uh, and if I, if I can, you know, have, have contributed to that, uh, step into a positive, you know, trajectory, fair enough. But it, yeah, that's, that's, that's quite an honor. Let's move on to the next one. It's a, yeah. And, and again, as we might remember, what Bassett was, a uh, another story and, uh, I was commissioned by GQ magazine to do some pictures for that. And um, this, I contributed to a few academic journals as well, because I actually found it quite, it was this whole sense of how people didn't support the war in, in Iraq. Um, you know, it's very, um, you know, people felt a bit, through the way the media had, uh, I've kept dr drumming things and stuff like that about you know this the, the false thing of weapons of mass destruction and but they were very supportive of of, of the troops and um, this particular picture which was 2009 was was the worst um, I think there was about eight bodies had been re repatriated and uh, so I'd, I'd done this but I'd also got into the uh, the police vehicle as well and photographed all the people you know who were lying in the whole route to the john radcliffe hotel um tom stoddard did a similar thing um uh his was in black and white um but um yeah for for, for me it, it was just finding all these areas like i say you know it, it's i wasn't because again this is gq and gq were going to send me to a, to afghanistan funny enough and uh, i'd met the commissioning editor and all this and but they never sent me in the end and uh they sent david bailey instead <laughs> you know uh, and why not you know to send bailey because everyone knows who david bailey is and uh so uh and uh and that was that but it was something again i felt quite passionate about because uh, you know i i'd done burials of our own guys when I was in, you know, I was, I was on funeral parties and stuff, you know, I've, I've done the, the gun salute and all that. So it was quite personal for me, all this, and just seeing the, uh, you know, these coffins come back. And this picture in particular was, was probably for me, the most poignant because of the steamed window. Um, because when these bodies came back in the coffin, they were literally how oh, they were found, you know, you know, if there were bits of what, you know, here and there, they were just put in the coffin and then they were obviously taken to a post-mortem at John Radcliffe. So for me, the steam in, 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 in the hearse reflected, you know, the fact that in that coffin was just body parts. Um, wow. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, like the Closer exhibition happened in 2010, which was brilliant, you know, um, at the time, Photo Works a publishing company and, and a magazine in Brighton. They were, I'd shown them my, um, I shown them a PDF of my army photos because a guy at Vice who set up his own publishing company was interested um, in, in all my work. And then he went to some bookshop in Hackney and he said, well, which ones are valid and which aren't, you know, and this, that. And he said, well, these army snapshots are, are, are the, the, the most interesting. And uh, so this, this guy at Vice, made a like a maquette out of a PDF and I shown 
the guy at uh, Photo Works. And as soon as he saw this PDF cat, he says, right, well, we're going to do something. We're going to do something. This is going to be ours. And I said, brilliant, but can we get this guy to design it? No, no, it's all going to be done in-house. We're all going to do it ourselves. And uh, anyway, um, so I didn't hear anything for a few few months. And I entered the uh, the Brighton Photo Fringe Open, uh, the 2010 one. Uh, I thought, why not? At the time, there was a lot of these things, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if you had to pay. Um, but I was I was quite reluctant to, to, to enter everything. But I thought, well, I'll give it a go because I, I'd already met Val Williams, so I knew knew her. Um, I didn't know Martin Parr. I knew through email because uh, I, I did a sort of email. And he was always good at emailing me back. Um, I think it was on the way to to the, the isolation premiere at Edinburgh Film Festival because I, I saw him on some... Pro, who's the guy who does the organ? Is it John something? He's like some Yorkshire guy. Yeah, he... he, he and I said, I saw you on that. And I remember watching that when I used to come home from leave in the army and taking great comfort. You know, I'd obviously had a few beers at the local. I think, oh, it's really good, this. And I sort of mentioned that. And he goes, oh, thank you, Shiv. You know, so we can't wait. But anyway, uh, so I entered the, the Brighton Photo Fringe. And um, this was the kind of picture that was used on the, on, on the postcard. And uh, oh, wasn't it, it was invite, wasn't it? I didn't know. Yeah, it, was, like... it, was, it, it was on the invite, yeah. And every, every, there were a lot of people in Brighton because obviously, I, you know, I lived in Brighton and a lot of people in Brighton knew me, but no one knew me as Stuart Griffiths. Everyone knew me as Griff from my army. So when they were going, who's this bloody Stuart Griffiths? Because when I turned, oh, bloody hell, it's, it's bloody Griff. Well, yeah, that's how close it kind of come, you know what I mean? It's, you know, Brighton, although it's got city status, it's still a seaside village. <laughs> But these are pictures from the exhibition, and this the, on the picture on the left, Northern Ireland Archive. We had a lot of space to kind of fill. It was um, a big exhibition, wasn't it, with a lot of different. Oh things. yeah, I mean, it was. It was. I mean, a lot of it was because it was just so huge. To, to, to such, so you know, it was like, oh, you've won the Brighton Photo Fringe, brilliant, excellent, fantastic, yeah. Uh, and this is where you're going to be exhibited. You've got to fill the whole space. You're like, ah. Oh. And yeah, that one, was like an empty department store, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, one part of you thinks brilliant, but next minute you think, God, this is a this is a big space. No, it wasn't a department store. That was the old co-op building uh, there. That was the other bit. But the other bit was the um, the Phoenix Gallery. Phoenix, which was down the road, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I had to fill the whole thing. So we had this adjoining room, and we had shown Val all these. Uh, a friend of mine had all these letters he kept. He said, oh, I've got all these letters I kept. Do you want me to send them over to you? Anyway, he sent them over and uh, I had I shown these blueies and stuff. And, and she said, oh, well, we'll get some photocopies done. and we'll, we'll create a little archive called the Northern Ireland Archive, you know, a little section. And, uh, and that's what that came about. So that was the original title for the, the PhotoWorks book was the Northern Ireland Archive. And, uh, and and then obviously to the right was the, the big frame pictures of the injured veterans and and it's, it's some close ups of or, or single images from that. This was just from when I was at New Belvedere House, the homeless veterans hostel in East London, back in two thousand and three. Um, uh, let the, these used the letters, so these are the letters I was writing back um, back home. And more portraits. I mean, the picture on the left is is this was part of the Vice fashion shoot I did, um, and it was great because I was I had hide out of a Mamir RZ with a close up uh, lens, you know. So I, you know, I was using some some good kit, which wasn't you know, which I wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise. And, uh, and again, just make making use of of of, of these moments. And this house here was, this was a, a an old, um, it was called, I think it was, yeah, Ty Gwynn. It was an old um, veterans recovery place up in Clan Dudno, uh, which is now abandoned. Uh, the picture on the right, that's, that was a hostel, a veterans hostel in Richmond in Yorkshire. So I certainly, you know, got about a bit in my, in my car, you know, during... I'd say up to 2003, 2008, you know, a good five years of, of, you know, in between press assignments and, and, you know, 
do my regular Saturday shift. I'd, I'd, I'd you know, I'd, I'd go out, say, every, even maybe twice a month to just go and photograph and inter interview, a, you know, an injured veteran or go and investigate some place. But the, the Ty Gwynn thing on the left, that was part of the Sunday Times magazine commission, which, again, was, was a, about three months of, of, of working non-stop on that. Got another uh, question here from... Sorry, got another question from Sophie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you always stuck with documentary photographs? Have you ever considered any other areas of photography? Well, like fashion photography. <laughs> uh, uh, I think I, I, I have tried, um, but it just didn't kind of work. Um, I, I did try to get to commercial photography and advertising, but I think, uh, you know, I, well, I don't know. No, no one ever says anything, but I think my work was probably too gritty or mm. too real or, um, yeah, it's, I think a lot of it again is agency. And if you've got, a, you know, agency or an agent to kind of keep pumping you out and do all that legwork, it's quite difficult to do it, to do it on your own. And, um, you know, and, um, uh, I mean, I live, you know, like I say, in Hastings, and there's not much photography work here. Um, and, and I've been doing a PhD for the last five years, looking at other people's personal photographs. Um, so, uh, you know, rather than this, this whole, I mean, I remember back in my days in university in, in the 90s was this thing of being a professional photographer. I don't, I'm not that bothered about that, to be honest. I think photography will always be there. It's always something, uh, and, and I've, you know, after doing a PhD, it's, I kind of, I found it difficult to kind of, you know, move beyond just taking a picture on, a, on an iPhone, if you like. Uh, but I slowly, it's, you know, it's like fashion. It, it kind of repeats itself. And if you've got something that's important to you, you know, and you've kind of lost a bit of faith in it, 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 it does come back eventually. And uh, so I'm at that kind of point where, you know, I, I mean, I'm going out with my family at the moment and going to places which, uh, I mean, we did this thing, uh, I'm like part of a veterans, I work for a veterans uh, a charity in, in, in Hastings and, and, I, and I do a lot of photography within that. And, uh, and it's like looking at happy places, you know, things that, you know, because uh, when you go through um, therapy and, and, you, and, you, and you have to relive traumatic events, which I've certainly had my fair few, um, to get you back from that, you, you've got to think of a happy place and, and then start recent you know, so a lot of my pictures now is, is using that kind of methodology um, to, to, you know, so, mm. you know, maybe become a landscape photographer, I don't know. But, uh, but um, I, yeah, it's, it's, you know, when you get known for something and then, you, you know, I mean, for me, I always just wanted to be a professional photographer, you yeah. know, quite simply. But, um, but my, I think, I think... It, my back, my baggage as as a, as a as a military veteran is it's, it's. I remember watching a documentary about Falklands War veterans, and he actually said, you know, if I if I'd have become an astronaut, I would have been known as Falkland veteran has gone to space. Do you know what I mean? It's, That's a good um, point where you've left. Where I mean, I'm conscious of time. We are going to have to wrap up really, really soon. Stuart. I'm doing a bit of Ken Dodd here, aren't like I? How you're talking about like you're always about the photography and how it's kind of spilling out onto, you know, you're doing your PhD at the moment or you're kind of almost finished that. Yeah. Um, about how um, your work kind of spilled over to the books. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll move on to, that's that, but this is because of the... This, the books happen because of this exhibition. So, mm. this, so entering the National Media Museum um, Award in 20, 2010, 2011... Um, they saw these pictures and uh, again, they thought, well, yeah, and PhotoWorks did the book and this is what we did the books. And then and then the guy from Vice who I mentioned who did the original PDF, we then made a pig's disco, which caused a bit of controversy as we, uh, as we know. From it was this. a overview of pig's disco. Well, pig's disco, if you like, uh, let's go back to that. Uh, is, is um, I sort of, and a lot of stuff I wanted to write about. I mean, because the myth of the airborne warrior is is it's got a lot of black lines on my narrative. I remember um, I remember giving Ralph Steadman the a copy of it, and he said, "Why is all these black lines on it for?" I said, "Well, I don't know, Ralph. You know, but uh, I guess you know." And, and he was told, "This is the way." I mean, none of our none of my letters were ever censored. 
um, because you know, I mean, I was no, I wasn't a brigadier or anything. Um, so I think it, it was great to have that. But um, I think out of the frustrations of, 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 of the limitations of the myth of the Airborne Warrior came Pig's Disco, which was a little bit more, you know, I was a bit more in control and, you know, I wanted to get the narrative. And uh, I guess it was, you know, like a kind of Roman Eclef kind of thing where, you know, obviously names had changed and stuff like that. And uh, they were using... Like the overview of what, it, like the basis of the book for... So the, so the basis of the book really is, is it's, it's like that crossover of, of the military and rave culture and how them two, and them two worlds collide. And, uh, and I was obviously caught right in the, in the, in the middle of all that. Um, so it kind of starts at that picture that I showed earlier of the, uh, after, you know, the Christmas par party. And it was the first time that I'd, um, you know, it was, we were on Christmas rear party guard, guard duty. I was relatively new guy in the platoon. And one of the older guys was saying, oh, fucking hell, it's, it's Christmas time, isn't it? Crap, blah, blah. And he goes, hey, you were taking any acid, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, he gave me my first bit of LSD and, and that's where Pig's Disco came from. But the whole thing of what the book's really about is, is trying to su suppress, you know, what was really going on in this very, you know, male dominated, super, you know, macho kind of existence and try not to get caught and, 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 and kind of how it goes in and it ends up in Brighton where, um, you know, uh, photographing the illegal raves and stuff like that and how certain members of, of, of that little small entourage became you know further and further into into, into drug addiction and stuff like that so it's, it's based upon real life events and um and i wouldn't say i mean it's i mean how it, it kind of ends with this this thing of like you know all i need is a warm can super you know a can of tenant super and uh, you know and a, and a bloody syringe hanging out on my bloody arm and uh, you know, my image would be complete, you know, and, you know, here watching the sea, you know, I'm just another piece of driftwood. So really it was about that kind of longing to, to kind of get away from where I was and, and try and sort of get back to the reality of, of, of trying to be a photographer, basically. And, uh, but also the thing of, 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 of addictive personalities uh, and about, um, you know, led by the treachery of others, <laughs> you know, and all them kind of things. But, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of, you know, there are a lot of military books, and I've certainly read a lot sort of during this PhD. Um, you know, th there's nothing that really kind of referenced that kind of moment in time of, of the early 90s where, you know, because a lot of them would come home to Manchester with me and we'd all go to the Hacienda and stuff and... Uh, and it was that moment in time I wanted to kind of document within this book. And um, I like to say it's uh, with the joys of the internet. I, uh, you know, this was the only printed, I think Art Review did a piece on the, on the myth book. And then the Belfast Telegraph did a double page spread in uh, about Pig's Disco, uh, which <laughs> caused a massive ruckus really. And, uh, and obviously the Mail Online did a piece which got shared about, I think it got shared 448 times within four minutes. And I just, and I was talking to the book publisher for, uh, for, for, for a good reason. And I said, and it was literally, here we go. And I, I remember posting it. And then it was, I think I put something like incoming and then sure enough, I had like about, about two years of like online, you know, abuse within social media, which, so when people go so, on about all that, you know, I kind of know what they're talking about. So, so did you go to the Hacienda then? Oh yeah, back in the day, the Hacienda, yeah, yeah, I was I used to get there quite a lot. Yeah, it was uh, it was great. Um, yeah, yeah, it was good. Um, good times. So our paths have crossed in the past. So uh, we were unaware well, yeah. of our paths have crossed. Um, so before before the have... before it got heavy, you know, it's sort of, I think the security changed in it and. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, Dana wants to know if you've got a Facebook page or Instagram or some social media to follow. Yeah, I've got. I think I've got it right at the end of this presentation. Um, All right, which, sure, I think. I know we're wrapping up because. Uh, so yeah, yeah it's, it's just going through Vice stuff. Sudan, twenty eleven, more all the time. Back in Belfast, in Siberia. Veterans of Peace, uh, 
travel you know journey to northern ireland in london derry and this my phd which i did and back to north uh, back to derry again um scenes of trauma and, and normandy which wow. black and white with the old liker where i went with again on 75th anniversary i went with a veteran group which i'd never have I've, I've, I've done as a press photographer because you know I, I, well maybe i might have i don't know but anyway uh that's the uh sort of 2019, yeah, because not, not much from 2020, funny enough. And there's been an Instagram address for all you Instas out there. Yeah. So Stuart.Griffiths.photo. Yeah, um, I've got I've got a Facebook page as well and Twitter. Twitter's Planet Griff. Um, yeah. I'm sure Don't people freak. can find you a, oh, yeah. a bit of a in the search bar. Um, Tasha, uh, I think this is a good question to, to to wind up with. Tasha asks, out of all the things you've experienced. What were the most positive memories you took from them? And is there anything you've learned that you now apply to how you live or to your creative process? Good question. Good Tasha. question. A good one. Um, in terms of what I've, I mean, I think overall, I think the fact of just taking photographs is, is uh, you know, because I, I, I grew up as a, as a kid and this little hardly any it's one tiny picture of me as a baby where my mum had cut out because it was with my real father and uh, and that's kind of it is me as a, as a kid um stepfather was a was a, a keen amateur and so there was more so i think the fact of taking photographs and preserving them is is you know the first part of the question and and what was the second bit so um, what have you learned that you apply to your life and your creative process? What have I learned from... Um... That, that proves that uh, you're paying attention to what I keep saying, Sasha. I'm quite impressed with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, <laughs> what, what have you learned that you apply to your creative process? Uh, I think it's, it's, to, it's, to, um, it's to be diplomatic um, mm. and, 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 be, and to be very open and and um and whatever it is you're photographing have have a lot of empathy for um and i've and i think that's why i've always returned back to the to the veteran narrative because you know it's it's part of you know what i, what I did i mean i i always reflect back to that moment of and, and i think it's because i joined at 16 and got out when i was 21 these are really important years in my life you know informative years and so but at the same time, you know, I am aware that there's some, you know, unsavory voices out there. It's, uh, yeah. But I think even when you're dealing with them, unsavory, it's always, yeah, always, always be polite and always be diplomatic. And and in terms of every, life, learning from everything is, I think the whole journey of, of you know, and, and and being able to sort of talk about it here, um, is 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 confirmation of that. So thank you. Brilliant. Yeah. Great, great place to leave it there, Stuart. Yeah, great advice. Thank you so much um, for talking to the students. And thanks for some great questions as we close this great future session. Thank you very much, Stuart. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very much. And keep taking your photos.